Okay, right. We're going to get a start because I think this is wonderful. Um, okay, so thank you so much for being here um, for the launch of our first kind of recommendations report um, and first outputs for preserving and sharing born digital and hybrid objects from and across the national collection. It's a very catchy title. Um, we're really pleased uh, with uh, the first sort of project outputs for this um, HRC project, which comes out of the Towards the National Collection um, project, which uh, seeks to kind of make uh, our national collection more accessible and to link it across um, those projects. So the, the joy of slides finally work and also you can see my street. So, um, so it's led by the Victorian Albert Museum in collaboration with the British Film Institute and Birkbeck University of London. The principal investigator is myself, Natalie Kane from the VNA. Co-investigators uh, co are Dr. John McKim, Beckbeck, uh, Stephen uh, McConaughey from BFI, Richard Palmer from the VNA, and the research fellow is Dr. Gabby Aragoni. As I said, it's funded by the HRC uh, towards the National Collection Programme. Uh, the key aims really um, is to lay the foundation for future research and to develop strategic priorities. Um, to build understandings of the principles, standards, uh, systems, procedures and literacy required to collect the born digital and to build confidence and capacity across the sector. Essentially, we have been working at the VNA to try and collect digital objects um, and to look at what digital objects might mean um, for quite a long time, essentially. Um, and we've been trying to understand really what it means for us to acquire digital objects. So this isn't looking at digitised collections, so it's not looking at scans or digital records of objects is specifically looking at things that have um, that are born digital in nature so it's looking kind of at our iPhone collection or and the, the software that is embedded within an, an iPhone which itself is a hybrid object or looking specifically at things which are born digital in, in nature and seeing how we might acquire that and look at that from a, a kind of a heritage perspective um, and seeing what we can do really to understand that as a future legacy within our collection. Um, the key outputs um, are a set of case studies on born digital and hybrid objects, um, a report outlining the recommendations for future research and policy for the sector, um, which we will be sharing with you. I think that we may have sent you the, the, the link uh, for that for today, and we'll then also publish and let you know what the links uh, for that so you can to find that today as well. A data model for decision making for community investigation, and a data model that aims to propose speculative alignment with the linked art framework, which is currently in process at the moment. Uh, the data model will also be hearing from Tom Ensign and Susan McConaughey, who as I mentioned, uh, are currently working on that in the moment. Um, and they will tell you the kind of the very early investigations that we've made around that today. The report we're really pleased uh, was published this morning uh, and you'll be able to see the work around that today. So just to kind of let you know the schedule for today. Um, so the welcome um, the schedule, it will be the welcome, the introductions and the housekeeping. Um, Born Digital Collections um, and Digital Dark Age from Joel McKinn will be the first um, talk from us today. Um, the Born Digital and Hybrid Objects from Gabby Aragoni will be talking specifically around some of the research that we've been undertaking and finding about what the digital object really is um, and how we understand it essentially um, from a perspective of uh, different, a, a different to the digitised object. Um, one of our case studies will be talking a bit more in detail, which is collecting VR um, and the BFI um, from Susan McConaughey. We'll be looking um, at answering some of your questions. Um, I'll go a bit more into detail about what we're going to be doing with questions. Um, then uh, we'll have a comfort break so you can kind of get a little bit of a, a kind of skin cup of tea and also to kind of rest your eyes a little bit. Um, the legal and industry challenges is something that I'll be talking about, which is one that some of the, again, some of the, the results of the, of the report. Um, an introduction to the data model from Tom Ensign and Stephen McConaughey. Uh, then we'll hear a response from Corinna Gardner, who is our senior curator of design and digital from the VNA, who was quite integral to some of the feedback and the responses we had from the report itself. And then we'll have our keynote and response from Annette Decker, a comfort break and then discussion. So with the discussion, what we will be doing, that won't be recorded. So just to let you know that this session is being recorded, which is a webinar. Um, which obviously you won't, uh, we've kind of kept from kind of having your, your uh, faces and your voices. Um, but if you would like to be part of a more open discussion, what we will be doing at the end of this session is if you'd like to hang around and have more of an open discussion with us, we're going to kind of close the session at the end and then bump you all up to participants and then you can have a more open discussion. We won't record it because obviously we want to make sure that people feel free and open to be able to 
discuss where they need to as well. And at the end, there'll be an opportunity for me to say thank you to our brilliant team and also to share a bit more about where you can find the report as well. Um, as I mentioned, preserving and sharing Bond is a project that we've been undergoing since, um, I was about to say, I want to say uh, since February last year, but because it was kind of paused during the, the pandemic and during COVID, we had quite a significant break, um, mostly because I was furloughed for a very long time and as a lot of the project team. But we're really, really pleased to now have the report and um, quite a significant amount of the, um, the project actually published um, and, uh, and ready for people to kind of share with us. Um, this is very much a recommendation report and a means for people to continue with the research. Um, it's not a kind of a final, um, this is what we think everyone should do, but very much an opportunity um, for experimentation and for the rest of the community to come with us and, and have a really great um, set of discussions about what we should be doing with Born Digital Objects. We're really pleased um, to be able to begin this um, new avenue for experimentation around uh, digital design and, and Born Digital Hybrid Objects. Um, so you'll be able to find this on our website uh, if you download. If you, um, I think also if you attended the event, if you joined us to the event, right, you'll get a link to this as well, as well which is great. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I'm just aware that my slides may block some of this. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see this. So during the sessions, um, please ask questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, because our wonderful moderators, Livia and Donata, will be able to um, answer it. So during the discussion, please mute your microphone as well at the end. If you'd like to ask a question, you can uh, use the Zoom raise hand function and be mindful of our interpreters. As you've noticed today, we have two BSL interpreters, which is Max and Lauren, who are with us today. If you would like to sign your question at any point, and that is in, during the session here in the Q&A box um, or during the discussion later, please type BSL question in the Q&A box or in the chat and we'll enable you to do so with our interpreter because we'll be able to bump you up as a panellist and we'll be able to do that. Um, I do want to remind everyone of our code of conduct. Uh, this event and its organisers are dedicated to providing a harassment-free experience for everyone regardless of gender, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race or religion. We do not tolerate a harassment of participants in any form and participants ask this sort of harassing behaviour are expected to comply immediately. Anyone who violates this code context will be expelled from this uh, event at the discretion of the organisers. Um, if you do experience in any of this, you can contact Livia or Donata um, and they will discreetly be able to um, resolve or to be able to speak to you about that issue as well. So just talk to them. There are two moderators and they'll be able to deal with anything uh, should you wish. Okay. Oh, that's not a comfort break. We're not having a comfort break right now. So what I'm going to do now is to hand you over to our first speaker, which is Joel McKim. So if I can ask Joel to please uh, reveal himself. Then we can switch over um, and he will be our first speaker of the day. Uh, thanks, Natalie. I don't think I can share my screen while you're sharing yours. Yeah, I'm just about to stop this now, which is great. The joy of uh, Zoom. Uh, oops. Okay, thanks very much, Natalie, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, I just wanted to begin uh, our discussions for today just by presenting a little bit of a wider context or uh, the scope of the problem that we may face uh, at the moment. And I wanted to do that in relation to this term, the digital dark age, um, a potentially slightly alarmist uh, term that um, tries to um, outline the potential threat that forms of information decay and obsolescence might present in terms of conserving uh, information and our uh, digital culture for future generations. Um, and one sort of classic comparison that's often brought up in these discussions is to look at an example like the uh, Doomsday Book uh, produced in 1086, a survey of uh, England and Wales uh, initiated by William the Conqueror and inscribed on parchment paper and codex form, which is still avail available to us now. We can read it, it's legible, um, we can access that information, which is sometimes compared to a 
uh, a doomsday reboot, if you will, uh, produced by the BBC in 1986, which was a collection of audiovisual and textual materials uh, inscribed on laser disc intended to encapsulate the, um, the image of the, of the nation in 1986, but already within 15 years was completely illegible and inaccessible. The technology had become obsolete. Uh, and it actually required a three-year uh, research project, an emulation project, so mimicking the software and hardware technology artificially in order to uh, extract the information. So these kinds of stories or comparisons or a notion of a, a digital dark age is, I think, quite useful for media scholars such as myself, who tend to be focused on elements of digital culture like transmission uh, or computation or creation. And this encourages us to look at um, the, the infrastructure of our digital technologies and culture, things like storage and formats um, and protocols, and to engage in a process of what Matthew Kirschenbaum calls following the bits all the way down to the metal. And if we follow those bits down to the metal, we find some interesting things. Uh, we find storage technology like magnetic hard disks, still the kind of dominant uh, storage technology that we rely on, that is actually fundamentally existed in a similar form since the 1950s, since the very beginning really of computational culture. And if we look at a storage facility like uh, Google Data Center, where so much of our cloud information that we rely upon is stored, we see both magnetic hard disks, but also as a further backup, uh, actually magnetic tape, uh, an even earlier form of storage technology still in use um, and relied upon. And in terms of lifespans, we can read uh, something like a magnetic hard disk has a lifespan of maybe six or seven years. It's actually a, a, um, a mechanical device, so it wears down, whereas magnetic tape might last 30 or 35 years, but we're still talking about quite uh, small lifespans for this kind of storage. The term, uh, the digital dark age has been circulating since at least the 90s. Uh, but it had a bit of a resurgence in 2014 when Vint Cerf, uh, the vice president and chief internet evangel uh, sorry, chief internet uh, evangelist for Google, that, that's their term, not mine, uh, began a kind of public campaign to raise awareness of the risks of bit rot and the digital dark age. Um, Cerf is a key figure in uh, early internet development technologies of, of early internet protocols. Uh, and he suggested that we need what he called a digital vellum. So vellum is uh, 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 animal skin parchment, the kind of uh, parchment that might have been used in the, the Doomsday Book, for example. Uh, he suggests we need a digital version, uh, something that will last hundreds of years as a preservation medium. Uh, and the program that he suggested was one of uh, a widespread emulation effort to uh, emulation of information and, uh, in, and digital systems, but also the establishment of greater standards for uh, digital objects. But this was the problem really presented in, uh, as a problem of information storage and retrieval, a very kind of technical problem with a technical solution. Um, whereas the kinds of born digital art and design objects that uh, you know, we're interested uh, in, in, in our study um, are even more complicated, we could say, that involve many more than just technical factors. They involve questions of uh, legal and economic factors uh, of social and aesthetic considerations. Um, and so these are cultural objects, clearly, that require a kind of cultural solution in terms of preservation. Uh, our colleagues who have been working in digital art preservation and conservation, I think, in many ways, have been kind of leading the way in terms of these discussions. So our, our colleagues at Tate, Patricia Falco and Tom Ensom, present the situation um, in the following way. They say contemporary art 
including art with digital components, has, because of its dependency on complex industrial technology, widened the focus of conservation from the physical object to include the artist's intent and the public's experience of an artwork. The outlook of conservation has changed from avoiding change to managing inevitable change. So we see a kind of recognition of the greater complexity of these kinds of objects, the wider uh, kind of community of, of uh, interests and viewpoints that need to be kind of brought into that process, and the notion of objects in a state of change rather than as uh, static objects. And although we, we are very much interested in those objects of art and, and draw from that uh, the kind of wonderful research that's been done in that area, this project also is trying to expand in some ways um, that field of digital objects to include other objects of, of digital design culture more broadly. Um, and that's defined by the VNA collections development policy as including product design, software and physical computing, systems and industrial design, web design and social media, interaction, interface and information design, video games and communications design, new media and computer programming. So a very wide array of uh, digital objects which sometimes intersect with the problems and methods of the conservation of art objects, but also sometimes uh, move in other directions as well. Uh, as Gabby, I'm sure, will outline in a moment, uh, notions of artist and, or authorial intent become extremely complicated where objects are created by often by teams of creators rather than single figures. Um, and the place of proprietary information, software, systems becomes even more kind of dominant in the creation of these objects. We may be wishing to preserve proprietary software packages themselves, um, or perhaps um, to conserve objects that are uh, very inextricably created using um, these proprietary systems or, or software packages. Um, and so the, the notion of a kind of cultural digital dark age is partly invested in the ways in which you know our relationship with these kinds of uh, institutions or entities commercial entities may play out um, in in the future and it's quite a complicated one having them be invested in the notion that they are part of a kind of cultural heritage imperative um, you know is, uh, is is a tricky uh, question uh, but the, the risks that involved, uh, if we don't sort of forge these kinds of links, I think are apparent in some cases. So one example is uh, uh, in 2017, a kind of fire that consumed the, uh, the archive of uh, Hewlett Packard. Uh, and that, you know, is information about a key moment in computer history, which is, which is lost. Um, just to conclude very quickly, um, the, the kind of just to allude to the sort of the complex ecologies of preservation or ecosystems of preservation involved in some of these objects. Uh, our case studies were not specifically video games, but we drew from this example quite often, at, and so did some, on many of the people that we interviewed. Um, and this is a, an interesting evolving area where titles and uh, examples are being lost you know, very quickly and and constantly, but also a very kind of active preservation community, um, which is quite dis which is quite um, uh, uh, dispersed and 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 differentiated is is emerging. Where we have key official institutions of collecting, which are uh, which are which are emerging, like the National Video Game Museum. Uh, we have commercial interests actually uh, being involved. So there are preservation. Um, departments in most kind of key video game manufacturers themselves. Sometimes it's because they actually want to remaster and reissue games. But then also very importantly, um, uh, an amateur or community or pirate community involved in uh, taking on the task of emulation themselves. Um, and that kind of complex uh, arrangement of uh, institutional um, memory uh, commercial interests and uh, informal community, I think, is a uh, uh, important kind of consideration and how these kinds of objects might be 
uh, preserved going forward so that we can avoid a, this kind of digital dark age. And I'll end there. Great. Thank you very much, Joel, uh, for your presentation. Um, and just um, to, well, to retrospectively uh, introduce Joel, because I realised that I very rudely did not do so. Uh, Joel is Senior Lecturer in Digital Media and Culture and the Director of the Vasari uh, Research Centre for Art and Technology at Birkbeck at the University of London. He's the author of Architecture, Media and Memory, Facing Complexity in Post-9-11 New York and was recently a visiting fellow at the VNA Research Institute working on a project entitled A Prehistory of Machine Vision, Exploring the VNA's Computer Art Collection. So that's Joel, thank you so much for that. Um, so up next, we have Gabby, uh, Dr. Gabby Aragoni, um, who is the research fellow for this project and has recently, uh, sorry, previously worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Newcastle University in the Department of Media, Culture, Heritage. She has co-edited the volume European Heritage, Dialogue and Digital Practice for Routledge, as well as a number of articles and book chapters and is in the field of digital cultures and heritage studies. So really pleased to hand over uh, Gabby to introduce um, some of the findings and instructions on the project. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, yeah, so my intervention uh, introduces our four case studies uh, um, to look at how they uh, are understood as complex objects and how their boundaries become wider and uh, ambiguous from the perspective of the collecting institution. So it is really like a pointer to, to our case studies and some of the findings of the report. Uh, while some more digital objects are uh, um, very simple, self-contained, like uh, an image file or a linear video file, um, and there are very established uh, ways of preserving them, in our research, we uh, focus much more on complex artifacts that challenge uh, traditional understandings of museum objects uh, and that demand uh, uh, new theories, new terminologies, and as well as new practices uh, uh, to respond to their expanded dimension. Uh, in fact, for example, our research participants uh, often uh, use terms such as ecosystems or assemblages to address uh, some of the examples we used in our um, in our research activities. Um, so in this, this presentation, I will discuss uh, um, the boundaries of the object in, in reference to the case studies, and I will uh, uh, conclude with some recommendations that are uh, more closely related to this topic. But as a start, I wanted to um, mention some of the ways uh, in which more digital objects uh, expand through uncertain boundaries. First of all, they often come as a multi-part acquisition, uh, acquisitions, uh, including, for instance, uh, uh, digital and physical parts, uh, code files, uh, bundles of files, uh, accessories, cables, packaging, uh, hardware, and so on. Um, they also rely heavily on networks and infrastructures uh, comprising the internet, uh, uh, servers, open standards, data centers. So that uh, um, we, there is a question whether um, uh, this the object in the collection is still the original object and, uh, and the question of the loss of their original online environment and how this can be, and how the object can be recontextualized uh, uh, within the institution. A third point is about mutability, which uh, um, it is especially in reference uh, to a culture of constant innovation. So objects such as video games, mobile apps, uh, platforms and software come in multiple versions uh, and also they might be acquired when they are still used. Um, and this means that uh, they're still evolving, not just from the point of view of the features that are added or removed, but also from the perspective of their uh, social historical uh, meanings. Um, and finally, we have uh, um, contextual materials, materials associated with the making process uh, and uh, uh, documentation of user experience, documentation of the interaction. Uh, and all this is not uh, necessarily just uh, related to the digital, the board digital, but uh, it is especially important uh, uh, for board digital collections uh, both because of the uncertainty surrounding uh, um, their long-term preservation, uh, so that documentation is not only um, 
super important uh, to guide preservation strategies and decision making, but also at some at the point it can become uh, the only thing that uh, uh, remains of the object. And also because uh, um, collecting in the present contemporary objects, we have uh, uh, a short window of uh, uh, broad availability of uh, these materials, uh, such as uh, uh, testimonies, oral histories, uh, and, and uh, the perspective of uh, communities of users as well. But uh, this window of time is, uh, is relatively short, um, and we need to act quickly. Um, and as a consequence, um, in our process, we noted that uh, the hierarchies between core and auxiliary or items uh, or the main artifacts and its documentation uh, um, can be subverted uh, and definitely becoming real, um, becoming less clear cut uh, um, during the collecting process. Uh, so we developed four case studies um, and each case study has been investigated through interviews uh, with relevant curators, uh, uh, examined against existing literature and explored during workshops with uh, uh, preservation experts and, and museum professionals. Um, so um, in this slide, I'm really just going to point at, point at some of the key features, uh, but then uh, uh, yeah, there isn't really enough time to uh, to discuss uh, um, the key questions uh, uh, now. Um, in the eyes of the animal uh, is a piece of immersive technology that includes uh, digital and physical parts, uh, in particular bespoke hardware. And uh, therefore, it gave us the opportunity to um, investigate the question of hybridity and to uh, explore how hybridity can be a significant challenge for institutions uh, who have uh, resources, uh, policies, uh, and preservation systems in place uh, only for either just digital or just physical. The acquisition uh, includes uh, a set of materials uh, associated with the main process, uh, such as uh, research and development clips or 3D, uh, 3D data. And this case study for us was uh, uh, an opportunity to explore the ways in which this um, making process elements are uh, uh, intended as fragments of the um, finished work uh, and, and therefore they're not uh, separated uh, uh, within the um, uh, museum management system. system. Um, so somewhat innovating uh, um, traditional institutional practice. Uh, then we have WestUp, which is a community-generated mobile app informing on how to handle stop and search uh, interaction with police officers. Uh, and in this case, we see uh, that the boundaries of the object uh, um, extend because of the role of the collaborative design methodology used uh, to create the app uh, and because of the app's um, distributed authorship. Uh, um, so the preservation of the app uh, in this case is contextualized uh, within a dialogic and ongoing relationship with the community. And finally, Instagram uh, is probably the most extreme case study. Um, insofar, uh, it proved quite difficult to identify its boundaries and to identify um, and distinguish the core elements of an acquisition from uh, elements associated with the documentation, for instance. Um, and I'm just going to spend a few more words uh, on Instagram, uh, because one of the most uh, interesting findings is uh, um, that the challenges in defining and, uh, and circumscribing the object in this case uh, are not just associated with uh, uh, the fact that it comes with multiple parts or techno technical technological issues, but uh, they have to do uh, significantly with uh, the bar with um, the business models and the corporate logic uh, uh, of digital platforms, uh, which are based on a global reach, uh, continuous innovation, um, are oriented at data extraction, and therefore maintaining. Uh, uh, a significant parts of data interaction and systems uh, hidden or black boxed. 
And additionally, it is cloud-based and lacks uh, an, an offline equiv equivalent, which makes it even more uh, um, at risk. So in front of uh, difficult decisions on what to acquire and how to preserve, uh, interpret and display uh, digital platforms, uh, our research participants uh, um, highlighted the role of curatorial practice, uh, the institution collection policy, as well as pragmatic factors to guide decision making. And another interesting point uh, in the debate was about um, the difficult balance between uh, future proofing the acquisition, hence uh, salvaging as much as possible to enable uh, different potential solutions in the future, and sustainability, which uh, um, implies instead uh, uh, being uh, uh, more selective. So responding to these uh, emergent understandings of complex for digital objects as a network ecosystems distributed, incorporating multiple parts in top-down context, we extrapolated a set of recommendations for researchers and professionals um, and summarizing radically um, to finish my, uh, my intervention. These are about developing new knowledge uh, on the, around the object and its behavior, around the role of the curator and uh, the values underpinning the reasons for collecting this kind of objects. So, um, and yeah, over to Natalie. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gabby. Um, great, fantastic. I thought you put your slides down. Uh, and we're on to our uh, last speaker just before we go towards the break. Um, and do uh, think about your questions that you would like to ask uh, Gabby, Joel, and our next speaker as well, Stephen. Um, remember to pop them in the Q&A and we will get through to them. Um, so Stephen uh, McConaughey is from, uh, he leads the data and digital preservation teams at the BFI National Archive. He led on implementing a new collections management system in 2011 and the digital preservation infrastructure in 2015. His work at the BFI National Archive is focused on the audiovisual, uh, audiovisual domain, where his collecting of born digital is now in its second decade. Um, so if I could ask Stephen to please share his slides. And Gabby, turn off your video and mute yourself. Please. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Stephen from the BFI National Archive. Um, so the case study is really describing an experimental acquisition of a virtual reality work. So I'm going to describe the case study and then try and pick out some of the main implications that align with the findings of the report. <clears throat> Just briefly about the BFI National Archive, we were founded almost 100 years ago in 1935, coming up for our centenary. Um, we're the UK's National Archive for the Moving Image. And that moving image is complex, but that's what we are, the moving image. Um, we're one of the world's most important and largest moving image collections. And I've, I've listed there some of the physical or analog holdings, I won't go through them. There's a lot and they're very broad in their scope and depth. Um, we're also the Ofcom designated National Television Archive and Ofcom is the regulatory body here in the UK for communications, including TV. Um, so what do we do for TV? We record, document and preserve 16 channels of television off air, automated obviously, since 2015. And that's a lot of television and we quantified it recently, 500 programmes a day, equals around a million programmes so far, equals around 90 years of born digital TV video content acquired and preserved under automation. Um, in the film area, we scan films to digitise them and we have 200 million scan images from that activity. Uh, and that's one image for every frame of physical film. And all of that adds up to about eight petabytes of digital collections. And we, we store that in two robotized data tape libraries with one copy of site. Okay, so um, in the eyes of the animal by Marshmallow Laser Feast 2015, I'll just try and describe the images briefly. Uh, what you see are uh, participants in the experience in the work in a forest and the participants are wearing helmets, some covered in moss, some with bark, uh, 
uh, and the headsets contain the virtual reality uh, headsets. And um, below that, we see the virtual reality work itself, which is images of um, insects and the landscape and the environment they're moving through. Um, okay, what is in the eyes of the animal? Well, it's VR, as I said. It offers participants an exploration of a forest from the view of three animals. Each animal gets eaten by the animal before it. Um, and as I've described, participants wore helmets in the forest containing um, VR headsets uh, to really experience the, the, the forest at its fullest. Um, since 2015, when it was first released, it's gone round the world in multiple different manifestations or versions. So from woodland to cities, in each case, the version is slightly different. Um, for example, the BFI curators experienced it through a HTC headset uh, with vibrating backpacks synchronized with the sound. Um, each version involves different hardware, peripherals, haptics, and each version involves different content with different dependencies. So that's the work. What does our acquisition, I always emphasize the experimental acquisition, um, it really is an experiment. It's not really formally finished or formally uh, surrounded with agreements and so on, but it's an experiment. So what does it look like? Well, the first thing to emphasize is we had extensive detailed discussions with the creators, Marshmallow Laser Feast, and they were extremely engaged. I have to say, say to the huge credit and um, incredibly engaged that surprised me at its extent so we went through documentation and digital preservation discussions what would what would it mean to achieve this we analyzed multiple versions and how the versions map to our data model we use work manifestation and item for moving image and that is a european standard called the n15907 a data model for describing moving image works um, we also explored how the files could be bundled together and preserved in those bundles to represent a version. Um, we, we then created tentative documentation in our collections information database and we represented the work in its versions there. That was tentative, again experimental. And then we ingested to our digital preservation repository and we wrapped the bundles in tar, tar balls to uh, to bring them together in a neat single file. Um, so it's bit perfect storage of the data and it replicates across data tapes in multiple locations. So it's, I would describe it as storage. Um, so the data sets are grouped, documented to an extent and stored safely. And I use the word stored very uh, intentionally. So what does it not achieve? So it's definitely not digital preservation proper. Uh, there's no understanding of what it might mean in the long term to use the files and what access might look like. There's no strategy to support the format, so there are underlying dependencies and requirements. And there's no collecting of the physical objects, not the backpacks, the headsets or the mossy helmets. Uh, I would like to say the phrase mossy helmets more in this presentation, but I've tried to limit myself to a couple because I like saying it. Um, it hasn't yet informed the discussion of the collections policy, so we haven't yet used it to consider what that might mean for immersive works. Um, and it hasn't really informed the discussion yet of the infrastructure implications, capability and capacity, in other words, skills, experience and resources to achieve the kind of collecting. Um, so here's what I think are a few of the touch points between this case study in the eyes of the animal and the recommendations from the report. Probably not all of the touch points, but some of them. So, so the report discusses collaborative stewardship. And I, I think it's interesting to consider how this work could be preserved by multiple organizations to solve some of the challenges in reference to multiple collection policies and mandates and uh, capacity and capability um, to be explored. Collaboration with industry, it's pretty clear to me that the close collaboration with Marshmallow Laser Feast to optimise the processes would be the only hope 
of doing this beyond um, the levels we've got to now. I, I can't imagine a scenario where we could make any progress properly without their close collaboration. And as I said, they were incredibly engaged so far. Um, and experimental collecting, which is tolerant of uncertainty. So this is, a, as I described it, very much an experiment. It's very tentative. It, it's an acquisition that pushes against all our boundaries in the Bay Financial Archive, collections policy, skills, infrastructure, remit, selection, uh, mandate, and so on. So yes, I, I always describe it as an experiment. It's unfinished and it's a tentative exploration of what it might mean to do this kind of collecting in our National Archive. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen. So um, we have a little bit of time for questions just before we have a little bit of a comfort break before our next speakers. Um, I'm just having a look in the Q&A um, and we actually don't have any written questions. So I'm going to hazard and see whether this is new for me, um, whether we can actually see if anyone wants to ask any questions themselves from our chat. I think that I can allow you to talk. It is a, it's a power that I do have. Um, so does anyone, do any of our participants potentially have a question that we've got when, um, I, so we do have one question, but I do believe it's been answered by one of our, oh, we do have a question, fantastic. Thank you to our moderators who are infinitely more aware than I am. So we do have a question for our panelists. If I can ask uh, Stephen, Gabby and Joel uh, to uh, turn their cameras back on, please. Fantastic. This is a great power. It's fantastic. Uh, so we have a, a question from Rita Acte. Um, how can slower, bigger institutions, so in bigger, uh, bigger institutions, be persuaded to bend their policies to accommodate fast paced developments? Which is a great question. Stephen, go ahead. Just, I mean, just briefly from a representative of one of the bigger and possibly slower institutions in this domain. And I'm not even certain it's all about policy. I think as well as policy, I think there's resource. And I think that for me, that is the, that's the more acute problem is policy is part of it, but resource and mandate is part of it. So we, we staff our teams and we develop our infrastructure for a broad type of collecting. And to shift that to a new, also broad type of collecting is quite a challenge. So, I mean, I think policy is just part of it for me. And I, I don't have an easy answer on policy, but I think experimenting can feed policy discussions definitely for me. Yeah, maybe I can just add that uh, these changes uh, tend to be always gradual and uh, never from uh, one day to the, the following day. And uh, um, for institution, uh, uh, yeah, the, I think one of the interesting uh, findings of the research is uh, this tension between the institution and the need for experimenting, perhaps on small scale, and uh, the small, that small scale, that pilot project uh, can uh, open up uh, for more substantial changes uh, sometimes. Uh, um, and uh, I think experimentation uh, becomes framed, especially in relation to um, several systems uh, which are part of the institutional apparatus. I don't know if Joel wants to add something. Um, yeah, maybe just actually, um, I could answer, I don't know if we, we, we can move on to another question or try to take them uh, in turn, but uh, as Jane asked a question about um, the role of audiences and publics and amateur or, or accidentally preserved digital objects and the opportunity for crowdsourced yeah. collections. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we have another question in the chat, um, which was uh, on, our, on our question, and so which is, how do you see the role of the audience and public shifting as many members of the public might have access to amateur or accidentally preserved digital objects? Is there more opportunity for crowdsourced collections? Yeah, so I think it's relevant to that is the idea of like how, because we, we talk quite a lot in the report about these other ways of um, 
thinking through collection and different ways of like again when we were thinking about um the the ways in which we we share collections or think through collections and how do we them into collecting i think that's probably where we're looking but yeah go ahead jill yeah i was just thinking about it i mean it's a really good question and um i was thinking about it in relation to just the, the video game example that i just that i ended with where it, you know you have this really robust community-based public but also frankly illegal uh practice of preservation going on in video games which both the industry and official institutions absolutely draw from and are, are quite explicit about that. I mean, it's just this repository of knowledge, which is uh, at the same time, it's, it's under the process of being restricted. I mean, there's been a couple of very large lawsuits recently. Nintendo just won a $2 million uh, lawsuit against one of the emulation sites. Uh, so it's being kind of curtailed at the same time as it's it's being acknowledged as an extremely important resource for the for the preservation community at large. So there's this sort of back and forth pull. Uh, and so it's definitely one of the questions that I'm very interested in is how, what is the role of community? And, and, and you know, what are these kind of gray areas, legal, ethical, uh, and so on that exist in this larger um, emulation and preservation project that is going, not just for video games, but for video, uh, uh, for digital culture more, more widely. Yeah. It's definitely something we confront quite a bit in the report and something that we definitely, I mean, I'll talk about it in my kind of talk in the second session and um, the, the idea of like this kind of the legal and kind of industry ramifications, both from kind of the idea of what is big, big tech heritage, as you mentioned, and the kind of curatorial autonomy that's often kind of negotiated, but also, as Joel said, the idea of us understanding um, how much we do need to kind of work with communities of care who have been, as Joel said, actually caring for this heritage for a very long time, um, and how we need to negotiate our ideas of um, provenance and um, of authorship and authenticity. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the second session. So maybe the, those conversations can develop a little bit as we, as we kind of confront that but I think it's really it's a really good thing to think about um we have another question um if I, I think I want to do a, a bell for this uh, next question because of the this like this, this uh, phrase has come up so early how do you think the further decentralization in web3 will affect the boundarylessness of work correspondingly will this increase our need to document our curatorial and conservation choices in a publicly understandable way um, I think it's really interesting because it's something that when really we're sorry, about, Natalie. Can you repeat that question, please? Yes, of course, Lauren. Sorry, I do appreciate I, I rushed, so that's my. <laughs> How do you think the further decentralization in Web three will affect the boundary boundarylessness? The account, the boundlessness, boundarylessness. Yeah. Um, correspondingly, will um, increase our need to document our curatorial and conservation choices in a publicly understandable way. So the idea of decentralization, yeah, and it's something that we actually didn't confront so much. And we, we talked about the network nature of objects as a kind of something that is not quite um, confronted in a lot of conservation work, in terms of digital conservation work, and something that we, that we know is an opportunity and a challenge that we need to be confronting as an institution. Um, a lot of digital artworks, for instance, and a lot of work has been, that has been done has been primarily on the conservation of work that hasn't been necessarily networked. Um, and that a lot of digital design that we're confronting, for instance, like social media platforms, are inherently networked as part of the way that they that they operate. Um, but the idea of the next to, to the next thing after that, like we're very much working in Web two, right? I think a lot of the work that we're looking at is, is preserving Web two. Um, I don't think we've really thought about it. Isn't it? I think it's a big, a very big question. Yeah, just I, I just add briefly that yes, I mean when we we speak about sort of proprietary ownership, we're usually talking about big tech, you know, when when in the considerations we've been making. But of course, there's all kinds of new ways in which proprietary ownership of digital culture is becoming much more dispersed, right, through things like NFTs and so on. So that the ownership of this culture is uh, is changing quite quite rapidly in interesting ways, which I agree we probably didn't have a chance to consider yet. I think maybe it hadn't quite hit us until the very end of us doing the maybe the final change. <laughs> I don't know. 
want to moderate this second uh, part of the of the um, symposium and uh, um, I guess we are ready. Uh, I can see now that uh, yeah, most of you are here. Um, so the next speaker is Natalie Kane, uh, who is the PI, uh, the principal investigator on the project, and uh, she is also the curator of digital design and the VNA. Um, okay, so over to you. Hi. Uh, so obviously one of the biggest issues within the uh, project um, and one of the things that we were quite keen to, co uh, to confront um, when working with digital objects, uh, born digital objects, particularly um, objects which kind of had a lot of these intersections between um, big tech, but also kind of maker and hacker communities and also things like video game communities and multiple different shareholders, was this issue around legality um, and uh, privacy and um, all of these issues that come and bump up against when you're trying to collect these objects with institutions and, and institutions of memory and museums. Um, so I wanted to kind of talk about some of the research that came out of the report and the workshop for that. So. So the meaning and values of digital projects, uh, project, products of everyday use from smartphones to social media platforms are shaped not only by their creators, but also communities of users. So obviously when you buy an iPhone 6, as you see on the right, which is uh, one of the most popular iPhones at the time when it was, um, when it was uh, collected, we have this in the collection of the VNA. When you buy an iPhone, um, as uh, Anishka Sams and Juhi Park have written about in one of their papers, when you buy it the minute that you open it, you customise it. It becomes something that's yours and it automatically becomes an object that is really important to you. Um, and we want to, as a kind of a museum of the VNA, as a museum of design, but also a design of society, we want to be able to record that and to understand the kind of many communities of users and people that make an iPhone what it is to us really specifically, but also there are many different ways in which a, a, a piece of digital design is understood. Um, digital objects have complex distributed and collective authorship, and we really want to be able to understand what that means for uh, digital heritage uh, into the future. Uh, sources of, of creation vary from the industrial and proprietary to so things like um, closed, uh, very expensive pieces of software like Cinema 4D, as in the case of uh, Zeitgeist and Geist XYZ, which is a piece of one of the case studies that was created using uh, Houdini, uh, some of the R&D work and Cinema 4D, but also very kind of proprietary fashion design like Marvelous Designer to open source and DOI projects, so things like the Arduino as well, um, which were originally created, um, and things like, we also think about things like Blender as well, how would we acquire something like Blender, which is a piece of uh, rendering and the computer generated image software, and often incorporate and rely on user generated content or go on to become defined by users beyond the intent of the creator. Um, a good example of this is Instagram or Facebook, so social media platforms which might be intended for one thing, and I mean, this is obviously much to do with discussion, but the idea of many of these platforms go on to have lives which have come wildly outside of the intended use of the creators. And we want to be able to, obviously, as historians or as custodians of, of design and culture, want to be able to find ways to record and think about that well into the future. Um, obviously, these objects um, are really disrupting the idea of, of ownership, authorship and attribution, especially when it comes to relationships with industry. Uh, for example, software such as the Amazon Alexa voice assistant or those produced by less commercially driven enterprises such as maker and hacker communities. So as an example, um, we acquired uh, into the VNA the Amazon Echo. Um, I think it was just before, it's, it's interesting, I think about the acquisitions that we made before and after um, I got furloughed, but I think it was just before I got furloughed. Um, and we acquired the product and that was relatively um, simple to acquire because it came under design rights in terms of us being able to acquire things and the actual being able to acquire it was relatively straightforward but if you wanted to acquire the voice assistant which really is the thing that makes the Amazon Alexa so relevant and um, and interesting to piece of design it was it would be really complex and difficult to do so um, not just because of the technical difficulties of acquiring it but actually the relationship that we would have to build with Amazon to be able to do that. Um, and that is increasingly becoming a complex issue with uh, institutions. Um, there's negotiating 
kind of conversations that we're having with um, with these large tech companies to be able to acquire and, and properly represent and um, the kind of history of these companies and also maker and hacker communities. And as Joel mentioned in the Q&A, for us to be able to work with these uh, communities kind of properly and, and in ways that are not going to kind of break our the rules that we have to kind of go by. And there's a really great um, blog post that I was referred to by Martina Heidvogel when she was at SFMOMA, which talks about the relationship of them trying to uh, reinvigorate an iPhone for their collection. And I really advise that you read it because it was quite influential and some of the work that we were doing for this uh, report and to think about that in terms of how you would work and then move forward and think about that and also in that DECA has done a lot of work around networks of care and to think about how you uh, bring in those users who again have been doing it for a very long time and how we as an institution would then move forward to work with them. So there is a need for provenance frameworks to be reassessed to account for industry archival cultures and to accommodate the complexity of layered and distributed ownership. Um, again this is things like the deed of gift um, understanding that often the deed of gift um, only has one signatory and often these things have many owners or many distributed owners. Um, we have to rethink about how the ways that objects, digital objects are created and understood um, often don't work in the ways that um, archival or museum frameworks do. Um, museums also face important ethical questions as negotiating acquisition agreements might endanger curatorial autonomy as companies negotiate protection over their brand into the future. There's a really great quote from some of our, um, one of our workshop participants and interviewers, uh, Paul Galloway from MoMA, who mentioned that there's the reason why um, MoMA haven't done an Apple exhibition yet is because they just turn it into the Apple store. And it is the, the difficulty of, of working with those things because everything that you try to open up and get into, a little bit more of your curatorial time you might be taken away. And we really do have to think about that as institutions because there will end up being this kind of black hole almost of, of, of history because of, of how much exactly we do or don't work with these companies to to kind of essentially look after this big uh, tech heritage. And um, there's also the issues around user generated content. So there's the thing that we need to think about, which is the need to comply with existing legal frameworks like GDPR. So if we are going to require something like Instagram, we'll think about Instagram. It's not just those big tech companies we have to think about and those kind of issues. It's the people and the acquisition profiles we have to think about. When we did look at acquiring uh, WeChat at the VNA, we had to create a kind of fake profile with Tencent because of the issues there was around user generated content. Um, there's a lot more I could talk about. I'm very briefly talking about this for the matter of time. There's quite a bit that's been written about it as well. Um, there's the ethical and legal barriers, obviously acquiring um, personal uh, identifiable information. There's technological dependencies. So modding, for instance, and avatars on platforms that is increasingly becoming an important and interesting part of digital culture. But obviously like the, the, the long-term dependencies and, and interests that people might want to acquire that into member institutions. Um, and the distributed and collective authorship, again, as I mentioned, the idea of how many people can and can't give away singular things and who creates what and how that, that leans on different infrastructures as well. Um, there's a paper about Second Life um, that's quite interesting on that as well. There is also the intellectual property rights and privacy and concern. So therefore, where we know that digital artworks have relatively straightforward copyright regimes, um, mass produced digital product design, produce a very different set of uh, legal challenges. So we're never gonna get the whole of schematics and source code to Google Glass, it's a trade secret. Things like this in architecture and design collections are also software space work because then in their nature, we can't treat them the same way as we treat media artworks where we can get the source code and have access to them um, uh, or the engineers, for instance. Um, we know there are some existing precedents and limits. Uh, so as you mentioned, video game hacking and her um, extraction of game simulation. We know there are things around legal deposit initiatives, such as the Keep project. There are things, for instance, with the UK Copyright Design and Patents Act, um, section 40B, if you really want to look into it as well, which is also says that we can keep a, co uh, a copy of everything. However, digital access is prohibitive and that obviously causes a, a huge issue. So we did come up with some recommendations, which I'm going to very briefly, I'm not going to speed through them for the sake of our interpreters, but I will just re quickly read them out um, for this account, which try to support some of the efforts for this, um, which we tried to pull through. As I mentioned, um, the idea of developing and supporting research into models of collaborative stewardship involving museums, organisations or communities to try and support some of these efforts to to think more collaboratively about how we can think about this heritage. Uh, develop and support research into meanings, values and approaches to collect what we tentatively define as big tech heritage. Uh, 
um, to try and understand those gaps. Uh, it's developed and support opportunities for collaboration across museums and the media and creative industry to generate shared and deeper understandings of the respective approaches to archiving born digital objects. Um, policy, again, a lot of this is centered about the, the potential for policy changes must now help institutions with memory in safeguarding expressions of digital and media culture and incentivize the tech and digital industry to cooperate to this end. Cultural policy must develop guidance to identify uh, collection responsibilities across the sector, considering objects which might fall beyond traditional categories and national or regional remits of many collecting institutions. Museum policy should incorporate flexibility and scope for uncertainty and experimental collecting. Again, there is very much an emphasis in this report about the, the will and interest and, and really kind of pushing towards experimental collecting. And then finally, to support this, as museums continue experimenting with collecting born digital objects, they need to develop resourcing models focused on specific types of objects and consider factoring adequate financial staffing and infrastructural resources. And that's the, uh, the final one for that. Thank you. Um, the next talk um, introduces one of our outputs, uh, in particular a data model or better decision making model. And uh, uh, it's presented by Stephen McConaughey, who's been already introduced, and Tom Anson. And Tom is a London-based uh, digital conservator specializing in the conservation of software-based art. And he works with uh, those caring for software-based art to research, develop, uh, and implement strategies for its long-term preservation. Hi, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so, so this is a, a decision model or data model, uh, either one works and it's for the collecting and preserving of digital and hybrid objects. So I'm going to describe why we did it, what it is in headline form, and then I'm going to hand over to Tom to talk through in a bit of detail, and then maybe I'll summarise at the end. So why create one is the first question. So the workshops within the project took multiple case studies and really examined them from multiple angles. And the output was very richly discursive. It was very uh, high in complexity, I would describe, and lots of insights about challenges. Um, the, the community of practice that we're involved in and representing, I would describe as at a probing stage. And some of those words there, tentative, experimental, questioning, mean we're very high in uncertainty and ambiguity in this uh, work. Um, so the decision model attempts to, to take those contexts and really reflect the workshop discussions and our experience, mine and uh, Tom's, and it tries to do a few things. It tries to codify the main decision-making processes that you need to think about when you're assessing a candidate for an acquisition to a collection. It attempts to categorize those into areas at the high level. Um, it attempts then to visualize a structured representation of the flow, um, uh, decision-making flow, a bit like a tree, but in a graph form. Um, and then it tries to flag where there are problems that either stop you or escalate you to a different discussion. Um, and then finally, it attempts to combine all of that into a, a traversable system and it attempts to make it useful for real world assessment. Um, so what does it look like? Very briefly, because Tom's going to give you some detail. It has multiple traversable representations and it uses a flowchart or decision tree model. And it has some key categories, technical constraints, collection policy, data protection, and intellectual property rights. Um, and the, the too long didn't read version of all of this is, it's really a structured representation of the key decision-making processes you need to go through when assessing an acquisition. And um, without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Tom and let Tom take over to talk through some illustrative examples. Hi everyone, and thanks Stephen. Um, so here we've got uh, an illustrative example model. Um, this is the technical constraints model, which is um, 
one of the models produced. Uh, so here you're guided through um, an assessment of the materials um, expected as part of the acquisition process. And this model flags the various important considerations and activities implicated by the technical characteristics of that acquisition candidate. So to achieve this, we used a visual diagramming approach um, based on the well-known flowchart notation. Um, so that essentially just consists of two elements, yes, no decisions, um, which then branch off um, and lead into activities. Um, so yes, no decisions being the uh, diamond shapes in this example, uh, and activities being the, the square, um, the ones in the rectangles. So we did this in Miro, which is a cloud-based diagramming platform, um, which, yeah, I mean, it was very easy to get started there and it was also useful for um, the collaborative working. It made that aspect very simple. Um, so this zoom in here is on the technical constraints model um, and is specifically focused in on, um, oh, sorry, it's meant, I meant to say next slide, Stephen. Um, thanks. So, yeah, in this example, um, if an acquisition involves any physical objects, you get taken down um, the branch that's in focus here. Um, and it's important to remember that although I guess there's a bit of a focus on the digital within these case studies, uh, many of the case studies within the project are hybrid, so they also involve physical objects. So working away through this branch, um, it highlights needs in terms of um, engagement with different aspects of collecting. So engagement with transport, storage, um, conservation specialisms, and it flags potential problems. So uh, if storage and maintenance requirements exceed the institution's um, capacity, this is flagged as a significant issue um, that would need to be negotiated during the acquisition process. So that's uh, an example of the, of the kind of modeling um, we did. Uh, it's just one small section of a much larger model, but it hopefully it gives you a flavor for it. And next slide, slide please. Thank you. So we now wanted to offer a few reflections on this process and what we learned along the way. Um, so we wanted to be quite upfront with the limitations we've identified to these models. Um, so I'll just run through those briefly. So firstly, there's a huge variability in the types of acquisition candidate that we might encounter in this, in this domain. So um, I think the case studies you've seen um, today have made it very clear that we're dealing with very complex um, objects and indeed often collections of objects, including digital, physical and ephemeral elements. Um, so we knew very early on it wouldn't be possible to model all of this detail. I mean, what we did do is focusing on some representative types um, so we modelled um, an acquisition process for digital data formats, for software and for web content. Um, but even these, we were still simplifying to um, quite a large extent. You know, digital data, for example, is a huge category with varying preservation practices depending on the formats um, you're dealing with. So in the example um, illustrated here, um, there's a, a zoom in of one node, um, which is have the objects been supplied in formats that are suitable for preservation? That's the question. Um, and then we've added a context note there. And the idea of these context notes was a way of, of trying to highlight um, and, and make clear areas where we've either simplified things or there are more complex um, processes at play. So that was our attempt to kind of work around that limitation. Uh, but even so, we're only dealing with, as I say, these representative data types here. So the acquisition process itself is also very varied. Um, and in the real world, there's no sequential ordering to decision-making um, and acquisition can unfold over long periods of time. And there's an inherent simplification in turning this into a sequential set of decisions and actions. Um, we are also very conscious of our inherent subjectivity uh, that we brought to the modeling process. Um, an inevitability that doing this kind of work, you bring in your own experiences and biases. Um, and as a two-person team, we're aware that even with uh, the research to support us from the project, uh, we're still not fully capturing the plurality of, of voices in digital preservation community and, and beyond. 
finally, it was very difficult to gauge um, the right level of detail at which to model. Uh, I think this is a classic modeling problem, really. Um, what is too much detail uh, that makes it overwhelming and difficult to use um, versus what's enough detail to convey what can be quite complex issues. And, and that was a difficult balancing act throughout this. Next slide, please, Stephen. So with all that said, uh, I think the model succeeded in capturing um, a lot of useful information about navigating complex acquisitions um, and hopefully could provide a starting point for, for further work. Um, and it also exposed a number of interesting questions about reconciling complex acquisitions with the practicalities of institutional working. One thing it highlighted was just how interdisciplinary this kind of work can be. Um, collaboration was an underlying assumption of the models. Uh, no one person is likely to hold all the knowledge you'd need to navigate these. Um, but level of institutional support might vary, um, particularly for smaller collections with less resources. And there may be cases where um, other approaches like cross-institutional collaboration might support this kind of work. And we tried to reflect those possibilities in the model to some extent. I think most significant for me was this question of what is a, a kind of safe level of risk um, which can allow an acquisition to go ahead. Um, so as seen in the example illustrated here, uh, we used flags to identify where nodes were conveying elevated risks or other issues that could affect the feasibility of an acquisition. So that's the, the red tag in one of those boxes and the yellow tag in the other one. So we avoided issues like this, um, ending the user's walkthrough of the model. So even if you encounter a, a elevated risk flag or a critical um, issue flag, you could still proceed to the end of the model. Um, but it's, it, the wording here was really tricky as the, the impact of these risks is not something that's, um, that's very concrete and, and easy to convey. So um, what we tried to do is accommodate an idea Stephen mentioned earlier, which is this notion of uh, an experimental acquisition. Um, so, so we tried to include that where we could. So now I'm going to pass back to Stephen to close this up. Thanks, Tom. Uh, just briefly to summarise, so we hope to publish the model and make it useful for practitioners. And, and it may be useful as a representation of factors to consider. Um, the limitations Tom's described, I think, very clearly are maybe difficult to really work through and make this a, a very practically useful resource. However, I think it could be taken as a starting point and potentially if your work focuses on a specific type of bond digital or hybrid collecting activity, you could model more granular, more specific, more focused equivalents of this for, for a specific type. Because we were generalizing it, the, the limitations were quite acute, but you could zoom in. And I think zooming in would kind of push some of the limitations aside. Um, just safe to say that modeling such a broad domain challenge in a singular form is not straightforward to say the least. So we will publish this as an output from the project and therefore it will become available to use or critique or uh, repurpose um, for the community. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Tom and Stephen. Uh, and with this talk, uh, we conclude the set of uh, interventions directly from uh, the project team. So now we are going to have uh, two responses. Um, and then uh, we will have all the questions uh, for the speakers and the responses uh, to the research uh, after the next break. So next speaker is uh, Quirina Garner. She is the senior curator of design and digital at the DNA. Her research uh, focuses on contemporary product and digital design. Uh, she also leads the museum's rapid response collecting program and um, uh, her current projects include a new permanent uh, gallery for the 20th and 21st century design and an exhibition about the promise and problem of plastic uh, today. So thank you. all see that so if not please let me know but um firstly thank you very much for asking me to respond to the work that you've all been undertaking so dedicatedly over the last many months 
and for the richness of the report, case studies and model um, that you're all sharing today. It's an important moment and an honour to be part of it. In making the invitation, Natalie and Gabby asked that I reflect on the work and contextualise it within institutions such as the VNA and other custodians of heritage and to project it into the near future and to think through what it, or what this work might enable. Now I do so from the perspective of a design curator working in the contemporary and an institution that is nothing without access. With this I mean that museum collections become meaningful when objects are put into public conversation, when viewed in the store, when searched for and explored online, or when experienced in the gallery, and that is in the here and now, and we must remember also into the future. So much of what today is about that also. And just as, as an aside, we do so in the company of Bubble Puck and Friends. Um, these are stickers acquired as part of the VNA's larger WeChat acquisition in 2017. Um, I can't tell if Bubble Pup is moving at the moment, but we shall take that as a buy. Um, but Bubble Pup is round, cheeky and joyous. Ooh. So, I see he's moving now. Uh, in the first instance, um, Preserving and sharing born digital and hybrid objects as a body of work, and as we've heard this afternoon, offers the very beginnings of a much desired how-to. Now I say this cautiously, as it is very much intended as the start, the direction forward for practices of acquisition and for new and urgent research in the field. Within this context, there are a few points of particular note for me, and they include an important emphasis on the distributed nature of born digital objects and their reliance on multi-part systems, networks and infrastructures and what this asks in terms of new forms of curatorial intervention and decision making when bringing them into the collection. Recognition of the less defined forms of authorship and intent for complex objects and the role of the user as creator or developer of such objects all of which also asks for new forms of curatorial activity and decision-making when bringing such things into a collection. The dynamic decision-making model that Tom and Stephen have just presented, while acknowledging the limitations as outlined, and thank you for that, and thank you for that richness of work, the model and its parts, or its multitude of parts, does from the perspective of a process-driven and at times seemingly Byzantine institution, very usefully visualise the complexity of the challenge. In doing so, it has the potential to, one, guide decisions as part of the acquisition process, in present form to a degree, but as Stephen, you mentioned, through adaptation for specific contexts and object types, and two, it acts as a communicative tool when explaining the need for differently integrated ways of working and for resource. And I think also very importantly for me, seeking to be an advocate of change, it offers a diagrammatic way in for those in decision-making positions often unfamiliar with the breadth and scope of the challenge. The research project as a whole also brilliantly encourages greater flexibility and experimentation around born digital collections. And with this, the greater understanding of resource requirements for, the, for their care and exhibition, for the care and exhibition of what we can call our digital present. Flexibility is needed as these objects ask institutions to work differently in terms of what is considered the object and in what we can do in terms of care and access today and what we can guarantee into the future. Perpetuity needs redefinition and responsibility for perpetuity can be shared across institutions and stakeholders. Functionality and interactivity are rightly considered fundamental to rich long-term understanding of all digital and hybrid objects. This capture of the heritage of the present demands a multifaceted approach to acquisition, including consideration of associated objects, documentation and user experience. The case studies make this case so richly. And of course, the social, political and making context of these objects. Additional useful items too, such as peripherals and source code, all to enable display, access and meaningful engagement into the future. <clears throat> 
this too requires more of the curator or custodian at the point of acquisition. Collecting is to frame the object in the moment, but also to have a sense of what, is pos what its possible futures may be and how they might be best served. In other words, this can be considered the ability to hold imagine, imagined public conversations in the future. The ever given is that when a museum or institution of memory acquires and interprets an object, it reveals as much about itself as it does about the object. In the context of the digital, this feels magnified, even more determinative at the point of entry into the collection. A further key aspect um, for the report is its emphasis on collaboration, and we've heard much of this today already. The work has been undertaken in partnership, and there is a keen sense of allyship in the face of the challenge that sits before us. And it too recognises that working with others in sector and in industry, as Natalie has just also explained, is vital to our collective ambitions and the need for resource and policy change. Today's event and the wider project bring together communities of practice and elucidate our common ground. And I hope too that they serve to embolden and energize individuals and organizations. And it's the organizations of different scales and not the individuals I realize here from my notes and interests to rise to that challenge of preserving and sharing contemporary cultural heritage. In summary, caring for the born digital is pushing museums and other institutions to reconsider the object and the active impact of acquisition. This is good. It's really good. And to this end, I raise three interconnected provocations that arise from the report and my reflections. One, digital objects are redefining objecthood. Gone is the adage that the object worthy of collection is the object that speaks for itself. Their distributed nature mirrors wider contemporary practice and the shift from artifact or object to project-based practices. Journey, context and use are as important as outcome. The digital is usefully leading this charge for an expanded practice of acquisition and value judgment. Two, future-proofing enhances openness. The need to think beyond the object to rich documentation pushes towards more inclusive modes of practice. As curators, we are cultural listeners. Our task is to go out to the world to look, to listen and to act. Breadth of perspective, voice and community are paramount. Representation, representation matters. And again, in the way in which the digital asks us to work, it is catalyzing awareness and validating new approaches across the curatorial spectrum. Power and three. Power-hungry objects are pushing the sustainability agenda. Asking what is needed um, to support born digital and hybrid objects into the future is prompting wider questions about the planetary impact of collections. Why keep something if, doing, if in doing so we are hastening its and our, our, end, our own end? Now that is not intended to be bleak, but it is intended to be, again, an example of how the digital in what it's asking differently of the institution broadly is also an enablement of 21st century practice. Thank you. Thank you. And that is a very important point. And uh, in a way, it's frustrating that we haven't had um, the scope uh, to explore it in, in our project. Uh, um, the, next, uh, um, the next intervention uh, is uh, Annette Decker. Uh, we invited her to respond to our uh, report and our uh, research. Annette is a curator and researcher. Uh, she's currently assistant professor at archival and information studies and cultural analysis at the University of Amsterdam uh, and visiting professor and co-director of the Center for the Study of the Network Image uh, uh, at London South Bank University. Mm. Or, um, her monograph, Collecting and Conserving Net Art uh, for Outledge, published in 2018, uh, is uh, a seminal uh, piece of work in the field of digital art conservation. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Gabby, so much uh, for inviting me, as well as Natalie and all the others at VNA. I think uh, congratulations to you already. I mean, you've done amazing work in the research, I think, and uh, not only from a research perspective on, on the theory of research, but also on the practice, really looking through the practice at what's actually at stake in the institution. 
Now, I've been asked to, to reflect indeed on, on, the, uh, on the first you know, iteration in a way of the report. And um, after reading it, I also had a short discussion indeed with the, uh, with the researchers. So I'm going to maybe repeat a bit already, which probably is a good thing, um, what people have said so far. But uh, yeah, please bear with me on, uh, in this uh, new adventure of the VNA. So I was thinking indeed uh, when doing a response, I was thinking back indeed on my first, um, I see a hand here, Gabby, do you want to say something? Nothing, go ahead, I didn't mean to split you. Okay, no problem, I was just checking indeed, good. So one of my most vivid memories in a way of the VNA was years ago, around the turn of the millennium, I was a curator at the Netherlands Media Art Institute in Amsterdam, and I was a regular visitor to the London's art scene. And this time I was visiting a small festival and in between programs, I sort of crisscrossed through London, packing in as many art shows as I could. And so I ended up at the VNA not particularly interested in ancient and applied art. So I was a curator of digital art after all, but I was triggered by a sound exhibition, Shh, sounds in space. Now I'm not a particular fan of audio tours. Admittingly, my expectations were quite low. So I took the headphones, the booklets, and with the map, I entered the gallery spaces. I recall walking into the Chinese room and the voice of a child popped up in my ears. It turned out to be Celia, a frequent visitor to the VNA, and she describes her favorite objects to Jeremy Della, mostly a story about animals and why she likes dogs over cats. Little did it have to do with the Chinese culture or the history of how these objects ended up in the gallery. Nevertheless, the perhaps naive but passionate stories provided a new context, a new layer, and made me look closer to the objects, while also trying to uncover more about their origin. Now, most sound pieces in the exhibition convincingly uh, transformed a space and its contents. Some made direct and political reference to the spaces of their choice, such as the Roots Maneuver, who translated the eminent character of the Norfolk House Music Room into a moralistic rap about the British class system, a translation of an adaptation. The haunted feeling that he wanted to evoke partially stayed with me. And it was a stark contrast to the dark, these darker tunes was the lightness of a soundscape by Cornelius that clashed in a pleasant way with the quirky glass room. Although I may remember it more vividly simply because I of the CD I bought when making my exit through the gift shop. The additional layers and translations nevertheless altered the way I perceived the VNA and the adaption made me reconsider the fragments and objects I saw. At the same time, reflecting on the experience now, the parts I remembered and recovered resembles much of what is often seen as the dilemma or the unbearable lightness of digital art that holds the illusion of transparency, access and abundance. Whether it's a generated film, an immersive experience of viewing nature through animals' eyes, a piece of information design that consists of an app and an additional printed material, or Instagram, scrolling through dog and cats collections. I still find it hard to decide whether I favor dogs over cats. However, though, for those of us working with digital art, either as curators, conservators, or archivists, this alluring lightness is deceiving. As mentioned here by media theorist Olga Goryanova, confronted lightly and omnipresently with the new aesthetic values churned out by the operations of computational matter, the curators or art institutions work is heavy. Indeed, presented with the challenges of technical obsolescence, the legal limitations and restrictions, the speed of change and being confronted with corporate interest and control, often we feel anything created digitally, including this video stream, will not be around for long. Not to mention the heavy characteristics of the art itself that is frequently distributed over several web pages platforms or spaces, both online and beyond digital spheres, as well as often networked, multi-author, processual and participatory, and thus making digital art ambiguous and transient by nature. 
Clearly, as we've seen today as well, this hasn't escaped the researchers. Taking the perspective of the practitioners in the museum, they selected a set of case studies to illustrate emerging issues, to pave the way to future research and collecting practices. Reading their reports and hearing some of their experiences, I recognize the struggles and the heavy burden of the institutional. At the same time, less burdened by the heavy bureaucratic policies and organizational structures and system, the art proliferates. And as such, a tension emerges between the heavy weight of fixing the future legacy and the lightness of the art's creation. Now, in an attempt to relieve the tension, I wondered what will happen if we turn the tables? What if experimental and small scale pilot initiatives are no longer aims, but starting points seen as recursive or iterative moments? Loss is seen as gain and authority, as well as accountability, is shared. In such an approach, the art is leading, and hence such a practice is focused on process, distribution, networks, change and collaboration. This is also how I described digital art, as a process of creation that, has, that is heterogeneous, involving incompatibilities, constraints, rules, and a certain amount of improvisation in which his own structures can be renegotiated continuously. Indeed, digital art has moved from art as discrete, stabilized, original and or, and or authorial objects to art that is performative, distributed, endlessly proliferating and circulating, processual without a final state and multi authored Actions of applied art and science. And don't worry, I'm not going to go to recount the history of the VNA. But what has always interested me is how the VNA contextualized and translated their collections into exhibitions. And in the discussions I had with the organizers of today's event, they emphasized how they are interested in archiving the design process, the creative process of the development of a project. This allowed them to understand the practitioner, the creators or artists, and hence the projects in their collections. Now, in other words, the object or project is understood through providing contexts. Providing context is usually seen as the work of the curator. And this is what VNA does really well. Following the experimental approach of what could be seen as a recursive practice, Curating happens through translation, adaptation, appropriation, and addressing the medium that fits the intentions of the artist, the artwork, and the contemporary context best. So how to curate conservation? While advocating for more experimentation and flexibility, and acknowledging that long-term preservation might not always be guaranteed, in the current report, there is a tendency to focus on what is or could be lost. Loss of technical parts, loss of relationships across key dependencies, loss of resources and loss of specialist knowledge. But what is gained through loss? How to make the gaps and the remains productive? So what happens if we shift the focus? Might such a shift of focus generate opportunities for revealing new values and enhancing significance? One such opportunity is to think of planting finds, as was suggested by Jill Sterrett, at the time Head of Collections and Conservation of SF MoMA. As she mentions here, planting finds may be the answer to addressing the range of variables in contemporary art and adjust the burdensome tone of authority that museums inherent as sources of objective truth by actively committing to seeing and seeing anew over time. A similar approach is suggested by Caitlin De Silvi when mentioning post-preservation and adaptive release. Adaptive release is seen as a generative stage in which ecosystems are understood as systems that change over time, with phases of growth and conservation followed by periods of release, reorganization and reuse. 
As such, adaptive release is not about letting go completely, but rather releasing a measure of control sufficient to open change pathways. Such a method tries to emerge uh, to merge perspectives on adaptation and change. It includes long-term and iterative engagement, while being sensitive to relinquishing control, to accept uncertain outcomes and messy change trajectories. Interpretation could involve storytelling through other devices and media, such as soundwalks. The focus is on the process and an acceptance that digital art becomes archaeological and that conservation becomes part curation. Finally, as they conclude, it will also require support for sustained and meaningful engagement with communities of interest, given that identifying and understanding current and future values is a shared process that requires deliberative dialogue and considered negotiation. I don't believe this is merely a prophecy or a speculative scenario. Reading the report and hearing the talks today, the first steps are taken by digging around the arts heavy environment and acknowledging its challenges. Now the next step is to embrace these challenges and move outside to enjoy the lightness. Thank you very much. <laughs>